tell us maybe a little bit of framing about what this article is and, and what brought you to writing it, and maybe a little discussion of the satellite library that the article is referring to. Yeah, for sure. Great. Thank you so much. Um, first off, thanks everyone for, uh, for showing up today. I'm glad to see a couple familiar faces. Um, so yeah, so the, the ASRC, the Advanced Science Research Center, is um, a satellite library. It's a satellite campus. It's uh, affiliated, affiliated with the Graduate Center, but it is not on our campus. It is, it, it, it's at a distance. Um, and I know some of us I can see here work in satellite libraries, um, off-site, off-campus libraries. And there's always a series of challenges when it comes to doing outreach for people that are at so much of a distance or that aren't physically seeing the main library um, to make ourselves visible as librarians to make sure people know who we are, what our services are, um, the value we can bring. And those challenges were even greater when the population at that satellite library is so different from the normal population at a satellite library. Um, normally, it's students, undergrads or grad students that are actively taking classes, uh, that have active research needs, they're just physically located at a remove, right? But at the ASRC, the, the, the population is, is uh, non-teaching faculty and uh, people doing lab work and researchers and postdoctoral students and undergraduates and graduate students who are in that space doing lab work, but most often their work is not tied to a specific class or to a specific assignment. So their, their research needs are, are very different. So I hadn't seen a lot of published material out there that addresses both of those issues at once. Um, there is you know, uh, no shortage of information published about satellite libraries. And I've also found some information about non-traditional libraries like a research lab, but I hadn't seen much at all uh, that brings those two things together. And um, it was new to me. I had never worked in an environment like that. So I thought writing down some of my um, successes and failures and my learning experience was, could potentially be, be valuable. Definitely, that makes a lot of sense. And um, I mean, I love the concept of the library as a satellite or the lab as a <laughs> kind of just a poetic um, quality that is interesting. Um, but yeah, I think what's interesting to me is that CUNY itself has kind of a satellite quality, just being a school that it's mostly a commuter institution. A lot of students swing by and it sounds like there's some similarity in the way that these um, folks at the ASRC are using the research facilities. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering if you could just speak to kind of maybe the broader implications a little bit maybe about your own strategies that you used, but then how does that relate to kind of CUNY as a whole if we've seen any parallels? Um, for sure, for sure, that's a great question. Um, one thing that almost comes by accidentally or, or unavoidably when you're working with a population or, and a library in which you are present, right? You, you're just visible, right? If, if, if your library is located in the same building as where most of the students are, you're visible. And even if the students aren't maybe fully aware of what the services you provide or the benefits you can bring, they at least know the library is a space and there are human beings that work inside that library. Um, and we all try and make ourselves approachable and personable um, to reduce some of the anxiety that comes with asking for help. And I think that's an important part of any kind of librarianship, but that is exceptionally difficult when you're not concurrent with, these, with the population that you're working with. So one of the things that I tried to do uh, while we were actually you know, physically able to go into places was just to be as visible as possible. Um, whenever I could, I would just, even if it was just for a morning, I would just go up to the, the SRC. So I was physically in a space. I would go to as many um, meetings up there as I could just to make myself seen. Um, I would approach people and ask, you know, what I could help with. Um, obviously some of that was email outreach and there's, that's the main form of communication now, obviously email outreach and, uh, you know, Zoom meetings. But just whatever you can do to increase visibility was one of the, the base level strategies that I've been using at ASRC that I also use while working at other satellite libraries. Just, you know, be a familiar face, make sure people know who you are. And even if they don't know 95% of what you do, if they know just that you exist and that you're around sometimes, they'll remember you hopefully when a question comes up and they'll hopefully know that you are the person to ask. Um, yeah, so I think those are, those are, uh, 
strategies that are useful for any Scilab library work. And like you say, at CUNY, it's much more satellite than you know your average uh, institution that size because you know it's almost all commuter students. There's very few on-campus uh, apartments or housing or dorms, um, and yeah, so I, I definitely honed some of those skills while working at Hunter um, at some of the, the branches up, up there. And uh, yeah, I would say those are applicable to most uh, CUNY, or at least relevant to most CUNY uh, librarians. Can I have sort of a follow up to that, Elvis, or Mason? Um, how do you uh, make, like, I think you're really right that people like they see the library and they know the library is there and then they may not know that there's a scanner and a, and a printer and a database or whatever, but they do know that the physical space is there. So how would you indicate when you were at the offices like You don't wear a name tag or a hat or anything. So how do you how do you help make people know you're the librarian when you're in the yeah. space. Um, sometimes I would uh, whenever anyone at one of the, at the, up at the ASRC had any kind of a question for me, like it reached out to me with a question, I would do whatever I possibly could to get up there in person to meet with that one individual. And if nothing else, that means that one person in one department up there knows who I am and maybe word of mouth spreads a little bit. Um, there were the occasional, uh, poster sessions or conferences that were held where I actually got a table, uh, some table space with a little sign that said, you know, grad center librarian, um, having my picture on my uh, research guides and uh, on emails that went out would at least in increase some sort of recognition that, you know, again, even if they don't remember most of it, uh, you know, they see, would my, they'd see my face and know that maybe they've seen that guy somewhere near something library adjacent. Um, whenever I did a, a workshop up at the ASRC, uh, I was able to get a, a poster up on the digital signage in the building, which included a picture of me. Um, which was a little, I, I felt a little awkward at first, just having my face blazoned up there, but um, it, I think it made a difference. Uh, people recognized me and yeah, just a little bit of awareness like that. Even if they don't exactly know why they're seeing my face or what I can do, they're, they might associate, you know, my glasses with the library or my face with re requests from re resources or, you know, anything like that. Yeah, it's really interesting um, just to hear about kind of these efforts towards library visibility, since I think so often people are like, the library, it's where there's a scanner and then I go there and then there's this person, <laughs> what can they do for me? Um, although we hope they know more than that. Um, but I think it's, yeah, just kind of interesting to hear about all these strategies that people may not even know librarians do. Um, and I guess since you've worked at um, some different places that in some ways are a bit different than CUNY, I was curious, um, at Harvard or at Wheaton College, did you find that that feeling of having to be so visible was the same or different or um, just in any sense? Um, um, it was, I think maybe it was because I had five or six years of experience at Wheaton College in a much more traditional environment, right? It was all residential, all the students lived on campus. It was kind of in the middle of nowhere. So, and the, the library was the main uh, student gathering hub, like, you know, at a lot of places. Having those couple years with um, easy outreach and easy visibility made it so that I had experience not even having to think about outreach and realizing sort of organically what worked and what didn't work. Just, you know, not having to do all the extra steps to make myself visible. I was able to realize, oh, if a random student sees me walking from one building to the next on the campus and they know who I am, you know, that might lead to some kind of interaction, right? So having a more traditional a residential non-satellite library experience, I think really did help lay the groundwork. So I knew the outcomes I wanted, right? I knew the what, what, what ideal interactions would be. I know what I wanted students and faculty to think of the resources I could provide. So I was able to adjust my strategies uh, conditionally depending on um, the, 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 those new circumstances that I found myself in. So it was sort of a, a lateral way to get from there to here. Um, but th that time I had in a more traditional campus really did help build the skill set that I'm able to use now for more untraditional outreach. Mason, the question, how about the question in the chat, which is one I think all librarians have faced. Uh, what do you do if the department doesn't respond? People are ignoring you. What do you do? 
Well, I mean, sometimes you do have to do a bit of triage, you know, when you have, when you, especially with, with this job, the Science Resources Librarian up at the ASRC it was a brand new position, right? So there, no one knew, no one had a librarian up there. Um, and, and that's been true of a few other jobs I've had. I've been the first science librarian uh, at two other institutions I've worked at. So um, I've had some practice with that. And sometimes you do just have to do triage. You know, if there's 10 departments and, you know, you can make inroads to three of them immediately and easily. If that means, you know, suppose you get in good with the math department um, and maybe you spend one semester with a lot of really connection, good connections with that one department. At some point, hopefully you'll be invited to a maybe science departmental meeting and you will be there with the math rep or the math department head or the chair. And hopefully you will have an opportunity to or maybe the math chair will have an opportunity in that meeting to talk each other up, right? So if you can win over some people, some colleagues, especially if there's a you know collaboration going on across disciplines or divisions, word of mouth is valuable, right? And you do have to be kind of realistic with your approach. You really can't be everything to everyone on day one, right? So it, it does require some triage, which um, I think it's worth the time investing in maybe for the low hanging fruit, like in the initial, stages of that kind of really complex relationship building. It's interesting because that the sort of like, because I think you're right, it's all relationships like a, that to me seems like the only thing library work is. It's about building relationships and connecting with people and um, I'm like how there's so few ways of sort of stumbling over each other in this COVID time. Like I don't run into anybody in the hallway. I don't I didn't like meet a student and then see them in the line at the cafeteria. So I, I guess I do you have thoughts on how COVID has shaped the the ways that you're doing that outreach work? For sure. And that sort of segues also into a point that I was I just remembered I wanted to make about how you can do some a successful outreach to to departments that might not be super responsive. Um, and that's through the students, right? Um, if you can get one or two students in a department to realize that, you know, if I can get them to realize that I can help them with their research, I can make their work easier, even if I'm not getting invited into the classes to do an instruction session, you know, if one or two students in one lab realize that I can really cut down their workload and help them out, that spreads. And eventually, if enough of the students are aware of what we can do, that does trickle up for sure to, to, to the, 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 the faculty and the administration. And I've had some a surprising amount of success with that uh, during COVID times while we're all working remotely. Um, I am, I have office hours and uh, I'm doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one student consults, uh, research consultations with a lot of students who, you know, maybe had a very clear research plan set up that involved field work and that involved data gathering and involved, you know, being out in the world. And obviously those plans got curtailed. And realizing early on that there was a lot of panic and a lot of really nervous students. And obviously 99% of that, you know, existential anxiety, I can't do much about. But realizing that if I could just make a couple students feel a little more comfortable with the fact that maybe they couldn't do the research they were expecting to do, but there's a lot of research I can help them with. And, you know, 5% of the time, 50% of the time, it's just like emotional support, just telling the students, no, you can do this and I can show you how to do it. It's easy, I promise. Um, just helping out with some of that anxiety is a good foot in the door to lead into helping with good research support and research help. Um, and so just making myself as available as possible to students over Zoom um, during these times. And because this part of the, one of the difficulties of satellite librarianship is having to physically be in a lot of different locations, right? Like the grad center main campus is, you know, a lot more central. I live down in Brooklyn. The ASRC is, is much further uptown. Um, it, it, it's a lot of time in, in, in commuting, which I, I was happy to do, but having the flexibility to say, I don't know if I have a random student that can only meet at 9.30 p.m. on a Monday, it's much easier to set aside 45 minutes on a Monday night for that because all I have to do is open my laptop in my living room, right? So I've been uh, pretty, I've been very happy with the outreach I've been able to do, taking advantage of the flexibility. Again, looking for some silver linings here, looking with the advantage of the flexibility that everyone working from home provides. 
I kind of lost the track of what that question actually was. So <laughs> I think it was like a comment and then <laughs> turned into a question. Um, but yeah, you kind of beat me to my next question, Mason, which um, was about this present time of COVID. Um, I was just curious, I think like um, we all have to adapt in so many different ways. And it sounds like a lot of your adaptation um, has involved like Zoom and, you know, making sure students know you can meet with them. Um, are there takeaways from this unusual kind of existential period that you would like to bring forward? You know, when we do go back in person, um, how would you change those perceptions of visibility based on what you know now, I guess? Um, I think uh, a lot of us, a lot of just people in general are optimistic and hoping that there will be a remote aspect to work that is sort of built into what our jobs look like in the future, right? The ability to work at a remotely work from home, or even if it's just this newfound familiarity with Zoom, even if I'm physically in my office and there's a student at, at ASRC or a student who is at home or a student on their lunch break at their job, who's able to, to go get just 15, 20 minutes of time to log onto the computer, um, that's gonna make outreach and distance uh, librarianship so much easier. Um, and, you know, I think this will continue, right? I think that being able to do more outreach one-on-ones over Zoom or remotely will continue. Um, and I think that's definitely going to be to the student's advantage, right? And again, if, if someone, you know, most of the CUNY students are working full-time, right? And so there's like evening classes and weekend classes. Most students a year ago, if they had a hour lunch break, didn't have time, you know, to head to campus to meet with me for 15 minutes, super rushed, and then try and eat a sandwich and rush back, right? Um, I'm really hoping to be able to keep this going, um, this sort of flexibility, being able to meet when it's most convenient for the students if my main hurdle is just opening my laptop, right? Yeah, I think that's like a huge advantage, uh, you know, and one of the things I love about working in and researching and, and writing and uh, about libraries is how material all of it is, right? That like, you know, you could have an analytic question about order, but in the library, it's like, does the book fit here on the shelf or there on the shelf, right? Like it's very material. So I'm interested in, in sort, of, sort of connecting to what you said there about the, like it collapses the commute, you know? Cause yeah. like, it just means that you don't, it, like I know that for me, I've, I've picked up an evening reference desk shift this semester, not yeah. something that I normally would do because I have a small child, but now I c that work can be spread across, like I, I can put him to bed and then also be on the, on the reference desk. It's been transformative for my own work, although I don't know the boundaries around when we're available can be, I think, a little challenging. Um, but anyway, I had another, I had a follow-up question. My next question is sort of, uh, so when the pandemic hit, uh, you took on responsibility for working with another satellite library, which is the School of Labor and Urban Studies. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on how the, the liaison work has been different, if there are overlaps between the work that you do with those two populations. Um, yeah. Um, they are very different populations with very different research needs. Um, and you might, you might share what, what SLU is for folks. Yeah, yeah, so it's yeah. School of Labor and Urban Studies. Um, I'm relatively new being their liaison. Um, and honestly, I don't have a, a, a ton of uh, organizational facts at the tip of my tongue, but it is a professional school. Um, it's mostly graduate students, but some undergrads. Um, the three tracks are urban planning, public policy, and legal studies, I feel bad if not having those three of my tongue. Um, and again, most of those students are definitely working full time, taking evening classes, um, working on capstones. A lot of them were ex preparing to do like field work, sociology field work. So they were also expecting to be, you know, they built their research careers on interacting with strangers or asking questions in person to people, which obviously is, is not possible at the moment. So there's definitely a lot of similarities in the initial pivot from lab work or field work to more mm, abstract uh like systematic review kind of uh, of work or the research that, that, that both the, the the scientists and the uh slu students meet um 
and again, just the fact that they are, again, mostly, most of their classes are 5 to 8 p.m. Um, and on weekends, you know, uh, I'm able to schedule an appointment, appointment with a student at 9 a.m. over Zoom. And if I know I have a class that evening at 8 p.m., I'm willing to do that because I can just take, you know, three hours in between to just, you know, close my laptop or turn off my email and you just do something else. Whereas if I had to commute all the way back and forth, you know, that would be unwieldy, to say the least. Absolutely. Um, I think we have a raised hand. Um, so yeah, Kate, do you want to um, a question? Hi, Elvis. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Hi, Mason. Um, so I had read your article in ISTL, and one of the questions that came up for me was, um, also, as I'm a librarian at LAU Brooklyn, and I work with a lot of science patrons, and so I was wondering if you've seen the research needs of your scientific patron base change at all as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, and that's either in terms of content or delivery, such as a greater consideration of preprints as information sources. Um, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. Um, and that uh, reminds me of a thing I wanted to comment uh, in response to one of Emily's comments a moment ago um, about the physicality of some aspects of librarianship. Um, most of the science research is purely done online. So that is one, you know, blessing in disguise. Um, not a lot of print journals were used, not a lot of print books were used. I, by all means, there are plenty of, of people that do need physical resources, but so much of the research in those fields is done almost purely online anyway. Um, so that has been thankfully, excuse me, consistent pre and mid COVID times. Um, and in terms of like the, 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 the newfound value or the increased awareness of value in like preprints or the currency of information, I, part, maybe because the, the, the people up at the ASRC are, you know, faculty or, or full-time researchers or postdocs, most of them have a very strong understanding of what a preprint is, what that means, the cycle of information. And I'm honestly trying to remember the last time I had to explain that to someone. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, it's, been, it's been a while since I've had to talk about that. Um, the undergrads and some of the grad students um, uh, appreciate, you know, maybe a bit of a reminder, but I find that there's already, there's a, that's, a, that's a skill that people at that level of research already have. Um, but definitely when I was at, at, at Hunter working with the undergrads, uh, that was definitely a thing you had to I explain and, and, and teach and also to, to, to teach the value of like free prints and open access that even though it might look different, you know, the, the material is the same. That it, it might not be formatted all fancy like in, like in the journals, but the content is the same and it's ethical and legal that the authors are making their preprints. Um, or post prints or whatever versions they have that's ethical and legal to, to use them. Thanks, Mason. I normally work with undergrad and grad students, so it's really interesting to hear more about what the advanced scientific researchers' needs are. Yeah, it, it is a very different, uh, it's a very different population, very different needs for sure. And that was the thing, I was not fully prepared for how different those were when I started, right? Like, I'm glad I had plenty of science librarianship uh, experience. But it was definitely a learning curve, realizing how kind of hands off uh, a lot of I, I needed to be with with a lot of um, the individual researchers. Yeah, that's um, that's I think such a great like paradigm shift. You know, I mean, ASRC versus <laughs> undergrads probably quite different, but librarianship has so many <laughs> levels and um, places to it. Especially before I was at Hunter, I was a science librarian at a liberal arts college. Um, uh, about an hour outside of Boston at Wheaton College. So it was even more different, you know, than, than uh, science undergrads at Hunter and then to the ASIC faculty. It's been a very different trajectory, or a very uh, steady trajectory, but very different populations. Nice. Um, Looks like Sean has a question. Yeah, hi, Mason. Um, so you mentioned using Zoom. Um, we're all doing a lot of chat, um, you know, reference. Um, what are you using um, to communicate primarily? And um, if you do a Zoom, is that, hey, it, are you jumping on live or, or are you setting up a scheduled meeting with your clients? 
Um, that's, a, that's a good question. It's um, all scheduled uh, questions. It's all scheduled sessions. Um, the, yeah, yeah I, I hadn't, honestly hadn't even thought of just like, setting open office hours and putting my URL to my Zoom meeting room out there. That seems uh, unwieldy um, and just asking for complexity, right? Um, so yeah, and you know, honestly, Mason, I've done that and it, no one comes. <laughs> so. I, I think I vaguely remember earlier in, in, in COVID times, you were teaching a class and I had misunderstood a, a communication. I thought you were asking other librarians to come and talk with you for something. And I just jumped into your room in the middle of a class you were teaching and you were like, oh, I guess Mason's here. Um, how's it going? Um, so that does seem uh, challenging. Um, so most of it is, but, but luckily I had enough time up at the ASRC before the lockdown came in that a lot of people already knew who I was. So people were reaching out to me with questions already. So I didn't have to do this whole new charm offensive to inform people that they, need, they should contact me if they need help. Um, so a lot of it was just playing on existing uh, relationships to schedule sessions. And that's one of the things, like I mentioned, I'm glad that I have the flexibility and I'm not advocating that everyone wants to do this or even can do this, but I'm grateful that I personally have the flexibility to be able to take an 8 a.m. 45 minute Zoom session with someone or, and then that night to take, you know, a 7.30, you know, 25 minute class. Um, I've been doing a lot of workshops on holiday Mondays, you know, an hour and a half out of my day on a holiday Monday isn't that big of a deal. It's not like I'm going to go anywhere. Um, and it means a lot of students have the time, right? They're, they're, they have no class that day. They have the day off. So they have the time um, to, to take advantage of that. So yeah, it's, it's been just pre-existing relationships and people that already know to email me or um, I've done a few workshops and a few drop-in sessions um, that were scheduled. And a lot of those like larger scale workshops led to people contacting me after the fact and uh, asking for help or sessions. Because I always advocate, I always, you know, ad nauseum say in any sort of session, email me for help, email me for help, email me for help. Um, and that's paid off. Oh, that's interesting. Um... Yeah, so it's sort of like a consult. It's sort of like you're taking your consultations online. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm exactly the consultation. That's cool. And I, I wonder if, um, it, I wonder if there's been an increase in consultations through this crisis, or um, if it's just, you know, more chat. I, I personally have had fewer consultations. <laughs> Um, it seems like there's more, but I have no idea how much of that is a result of the quarantine and the lockdown or how much of it, how much of it is just a steady progression of, you know, I spent a year and a half doing relationship building that was leading to a already steady progression of, of increasing consults. Um, I don't think you could remove those two, but I don't know which one takes primacy um, in uh, these patterns I'm seeing. Right. But your timing was good, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think the perception of what is happening in COVID is we'll look back and wonder. <laughs> um, but um, one question that I think um, someone was asking in the chat, which is almost a little bit meta, but um, you know, you've referenced like your previous work and uh, the person asked if you had to start now as a totally brand new person, what would you do differently? So that's kind of uh, reflexive and um, one can never know, but I'm curious what your thoughts would be. <laughs> Man, I mean, I've been so f lucky that, you know, my undergrad work in, in the sciences and in biology and in zoology and zoo and aquarium science have segued so nicely from taking such a sharp pivot from, you know, working at the Detroit Zoo to getting a library degree to, you know, being a full-time science librarian that, I mean, I, yeah, I don't not, not to sound too, uh, you know, silver spoon, but I have, don't, I wouldn't make any major changes. Um, I have been very fortunate that I had a academic undergrad and background that is not wild, that is not widely represented in librarianship. So having a slightly unique skill set really has really paid off. Um, and I'm very grateful uh, for that. Um, 
Yeah, and I'm also I'm grateful that you know I I enjoy the sciences. I like the science work that I did before I switched to librarianship, and just any ability that anyone thinking about librarianship would have to connect a previous skill set or an academic interest with librarianship is you know essential for your mental health and enjoyment of your job. Um, yeah, uh, other than that, I think it's a bit too abstract or meta for me to really wrap my head around um, right now, but it's, a, it's an interesting question I'm going to be thinking about. Okay, so I want to pivot just a little bit to some of your earlier uh, research mm -hmm. uh, into comics as a pathway to information literacy. Uh, do you have any connections between, and maybe you could describe that research a little bit for folks who are here and share a bit about connections between that and what you're doing with science researchers. For sure, for sure. It's an interesting question. Um, and you know, as I I'll briefly explain the work I did with comics, and it is on the surface wildly divergent from the populations I'm working with now. Um, I was part of a group uh, at Hunter College, um, Sarah Ward and Stephanie Margolin, that were um, using comics and visual media as a gateway or as a surrogate to teach incoming freshmen how to ask questions. So the super uh, elevator pitch, we would give students a single panel from a comic book and ask them to ask as many questions about that panel as possible, be it about the content, the creation, anything more meta, anything at all about it. And then we would give them the page on which that panel appeared. And then we told them to read the full page and see how many of their initial questions they could answer based on the context of the surrounding panels. Um, which sort of our hope was that it would be a bit of an analog for, you know, the initial panel would stand in for either one paper that you read or an interesting idea that you had, and then you'd ask a bunch of questions about it, and then the full page would stand in for the first or second stage of the research process where you read a few articles. And then from that point, we would ask, ask them to ask as many questions as possible about the full page from the comic book, um, just to just force or encourage students to ask questions as much as possible to really learn the art of asking a good question. Um, you know, when you ask 100 questions about, you know, a single picture of Batman, and then you realize which ones of those are answerable, it's, it's a very uh, simple and intuitive way to realize what kind of questions are answerable. So that's the crux of the work that I was doing at, at Hunter. And there's two main threads that I think I'm able to apply to the work I'm currently doing. And I think some of these are, would be true for anyone, any kind of librarianship. Um, one would just be, you know, the panel to page question process is very similar to just the reference interview that we've all had to do, right? Helping students figure out what the question they're actually asking is. And that's what sort of was the, the genesis of this project in the first place was the realization that at no point in a lot of curricula are students taught how to ask questions. And we definitely see that in every reference interview that we do. So we really wanted to, to, to work on that. So that skill in teaching people to ask questions has paid off in, in, in reference interviews. Um, and I've also found one of the reasons we picked comic panels was because we hoped they would be non-intimidating and narrative. Um, so removing any barrier between you know, the student's goal and their, their skill set. We didn't want them to be intimidated by the work. So it's a good reminder to just reassure the students that I'm working with that they can do this. And, you know, it, it's not as hard as they think. And a lot of it's like, you got this. Come on, you got this. So part of it was just the, the reassurance and like the, just the hand holding aspect of it. But also it helped me sort of crystallize the value of narrative just in teaching it period, right? Whenever I do a workshop or a class, um, or even just asking, you know, just simple, simple questions with students, I, any attempt at a narrative makes it easier to understand and easier to pay attention, right? And it might simply be, you know, almost Socratic, like I'm gonna ask you questions um, that you have to answer to me to you know, help you get from point A to point B, which is kind of narrative, right? I'll set up a problem ask the students to help solve it. And, you know, they can sort of see the story moving forward. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's the, so the, the, those are definitely abstract things that uh, I think any of us can apply to our, our library research, um, our, our library work uh, with students, with faculty, uh, anything. 
but yeah, incorporating any kind of story or narrative, uh, I think makes any session much, much more interesting. Definitely. Um, yeah, as a fellow comics person, I'm like, of course, it makes complete sense. <laughs> and, um, yeah, um, yeah, and I love the idea of like making them uh, ask questions about Batman. Um, um, I'm curious, like, if there is kind of, um, and maybe you already sort of answered this a little bit, but I was just curious about how this um, framework of comics, um, you know, kind of maps over to your work with AISRC. You know, because working with graduate students of any kind is, um, you know, of course, so different than undergrads. But I'm just curious if um, you know, any of those kind of themes of the narrative or like visual cues and questions and sort of encouraging that art of asking questions, um, if any of that changes when perhaps the audience thinks they already know the question or the answer, you know, I'm just wondering about that role and the tensions. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's a fantastic question. And, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, not to be too glib, but, you know, we sort of joke when we're working with, you know, undergrads that they think they know the answer. Um, and, you know, we have to sort of help them realize that maybe they know part of it, but not all of it. Um, but when it comes to working with the, the level of research that some of the grad students and the faculty are doing, um, there's oftentimes that they do actually know everything. They actually, or they know as much as they need. They know way more than I do. Um, they, they, have, they have so much information at their fingertips and that, that they've learned and done in the labs um, that, reminding them of the value of narrative is also helpful then when they're working on writing their papers or stringing their ideas together. Obviously, a scientific paper has a very rigorous structure, um, but it can be easy sometimes to overlook what you don't know, right? You know, you're, answer you're answering the questions, um, and it can be sometimes hard to keep in mind that there's the bits that you overlook it. And if you think about your paper and your question as more of a narrative, with you know a point A, point B, point C, as opposed to just um, materials, methods, conclusions, um, it might be easier to potentially identify some some shortcomings um, or some some gaps. And obviously, that's not going to be universal, and it's not going to be applicable to everybody I'm working with up there. Um, but yeah, just helping people to think about their research process as a, a narrative uh, with a with a story and a plot um, makes it maybe potentially easier to identify gaps in, in your research. Yeah, I love that. Um, and also, yeah, I think story for grant applications or anything where you may not be conscious of the story, but someone really needs to know what your story is. Um, I think that, that's a fantastic point. Um, for grant applications or any time you're called upon to communicate your science to non-scientists or even scientists in a different field, right? Um, being able to turn your your lab work into a story means that you can communicate it effectively, which, you know, um, for the public good obviously is important to get science as much as possible for purely selfish reasons. If you can turn it into a narrative, it might be easier to do grant applications, to get money, to get people to pay for your science. So I think, I think narrative and plot is very important and sometimes those do get overlooked. I'm sure we've all read plenty of needlessly dry not just science, but just research in general, and just being able to spice it up with a touch of, I don't know, narrative uh, is valuable. That's great. I hadn't thought, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it in precisely that way. So I'm grateful for that. Yeah, if I'm that analytic that. intervention, Mason. That's cool. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that a lot with with, with scientists. Yeah. Um, Okay, I'm going to have more questions about that after I'm able to process it a little more fully. But we have a question in the chat from Stephanie uh, Capsudo. Your article talks about workshops. Have you hosted workshops during COVID? And if so, can you speak to that experience? Yeah, it's been maybe f I have done workshops during COVID. And um, some of them have been traditional workshops. Uh, you know, I'll have 15 students that want to learn how to do advanced search in web of science. And, you know, I'll advertise that the workshop is at X o'clock on whatever day. They register, they show up, I can do screen sharing. And it's, it, it makes it harder to have a conversation with the students and to do some sort of back and forth Q&A. It ends up a little a lot more exhausting because I'm kind of just talking at my screen. Um, Whenever yeah, and when I'm when I'm teaching, I get so much from the interaction. Right, I miss that. You know, part. I miss that part a lot. And we have like, I'll have my workshop, and it'll be all black boxes and me, and there's none of that. Yeah, nothing coming back at you, which is why I've just interrupted you to 
sort of produce some sensation of that. But yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Um, but one thing that I've done to sort of combat that fatigue or that sense of distance um, is, like I mentioned earlier, I'm constantly repeating over and over and over and over in those sessions, please email me, please contact me, let's have one-on-one -on -one sessions. And almost every session leads to, even if it's just one single one-on-one -on -one session scheduled two weeks down the road, you know, that, that wasn't you know, immediate gratification, but after a month or two watching the slowly building pile of students who are reaching out to me after these workshops, uh, it gives me some of the, the, the gratification and the uh, sense of success that, that I get from actually talking to students one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so some of my workshops have been like that. Uh, and I think they've been pretty successful. Um, but I've also done a few where there's been a communicating your science event, uh, uh, semester long, if not longer event going on at the ASRC. Um, and there was, I was able to find, while working with the people that were organizing that, we were able to find some really good uh, commonalities between the workshops I used to run solo and the programming they were setting up for that event series. And uh, so I was able to, you know, for the, the, the kickoff event in that um, was called Meet the Librarian. So, you know, um, it was under the umbrella of a much bigger series. So a lot of people were coming to every event and being able to uh, sort of dovetail nicely and, 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 and be part of a pre-existing bigger event made it easier to, to connect with people. Um, and, you know, we all know the challenge is, you know, people who don't think they, they need research help or don't realize what research help they need or just to get yourself, especially when you're working with a satellite, just to get yourself physically into a space that you are so physically removed from being a part of these other events uh, has really helped my uh, outreach and my communication with that population. Yeah, I mean, I think there's so much like struggle with against the idea that the library is uh, peripheral to the academic project. And so just like going where our users are and doing the sort of connection work there is, I think, a, a good approach. Mm -hmm. John, do you want to Question from the chat. Speaking of like getting a more interactive feeling, John Carey. Oh, oh hi, John. Oh, John. hi. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah. I was just doing, yeah, thanks for the article. Um, and uh, this is a great conversation. And it seems like most of what you've been doing there, even, even after going remote in distance learning, has been live or, and synchronous sessions. Uh, do you see any role for asynchronous uh, you know, tools in this? Most definitely, most definitely. Um, but I'm, I'm having a hard time gra gra like figuring out what the best use of that is, right? And it's, I, I like, it, it's, you know, you get the immediate sort of gratification of doing the live instruction, the live work, but it is much more time consuming. And I honestly, I, I would, I'm, I'm part of a, a video uh, instruction team at the, at the grad center where we're thinking about putting, or not think we are making some videos to address some of that and to do some asynchronous instruction. Um, but I honestly don't know, I don't know enough about, about that to honestly be able to answer that question effic efficiently. Um, it would probably be a more efficient use of my time, but I don't know if it's a more efficient use of the student's time. Right, like maybe 50 students could watch a 15 minute video that I put up, but I don't know if they're gonna get as much out of it as if I was to meet with four of those students for an hour each. Um, I just think so much of librarianship and so much of teaching is that connection, that like back and forth. Um, I'm deeply, <laughs> like I'm just deeply suspicious of the power of asynchronous anything, you know, to like sort of make connections. I, I think I agree with you, Mason, like 50 people view the thing, but and I don't know. Hopefully, I mean, enough people are sort of being unavoidably forced into asynchronous learning right now. And they mm -hmm. see that maybe some good research will come out of it and some best practices. I honestly, it may be part of it because I have, I'm doing so much live instruction that I don't have the time to, to, to plan for asynchronous. I don't have the time in my day to prep a 45 minute video, right? To, to write and edit it, I just don't have the time. Um, mm -hmm. So 
I'm, so, I'm, I'm excited to read the articles that come out of this, but I don't have uh, any insight, unfortunately, on that. One thing I found interesting with my workshops, and I'd be interested in hearing from the rest of the audience also, is uh, and like attendance is through the roof. I mean, there have been a couple of duds in my sort of like attempts to produce community and and you know knowledge formation, but mostly like workshops that I would run here on campus for 12 students or six students even are getting you know, how much Elvis, how many people came to the Scrivener workshop? And we've had kind of, yeah, I think it was like, 50, I don't know, it's just uh, like 50 people at a Scrivener workshop. And like, you know, if you were throw a workshop in the library and no one comes, is it really a workshop is like, I don't know. That's the question I'm always asking myself, but we've got these like crowds coming. I don't know, have you seen your numbers go up, Mason? Um, since so much of what I have been doing is one on one, my, my, uh, okay. Numbers for one on one are astronomical. Uh, even yeah, even compared to when I was able to meet with people in person, um, the attendance for my workshops is higher. I think a little bit, but I'm not doing as many invited like drop-in BI sessions into another class. So those numbers I think are down, um, just because I, I just, I'm not getting those invites into those classes. Or you know, I'll get three minutes in just to say, hey, I, I'm, I'm over here, here's my email. Um, I'm not scary, you know. Um, but yeah, my one-on-one my -on -one consults are astronomical compared to what they ever have been before. Courtney, you have your hand up. Do you want to go ahead? And ask your question. Oh sure. So I, I actually just put it in chat. I just when you were talking about this interactivity, it reminded me that I actually had to do a chat consult last week without the student speaking to me. And uh, you know, it it was really we we mostly you know I talked and then I asked her to respond <laughs> in chat. It was exhausting, but um, but good. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, it can be tricky, you know, with students being here and there and everywhere, um, you know, in different contexts, like whether they can really speak freely or whether it's fair or ethical, you know, to ask them to turn on their camera is um, big consideration. Definitely. Yeah, I've tried to make it a point to never ask a student to put on a, a webcam. Like, yeah, I've never, I've, I've never asked one, a student to and I, yeah, I can't think of a reason why I would need to, right? Like, it just seems it's a decision so far beyond what I have any uh, information about that. And I, I miss it. I would like to be able to see people face to face, but yeah. I bet that's the thing we get a lot of post COVID research on. It's like why people do and don't turn on cameras and synchronous sessions. It seems like someone's, I'm sure, researching that, not me though. Yeah, and see, like, some sort of testing to see if turning on or off, keep your camera off increases your attention or increases yeah, your, your engagement. Something. Yeah. Or just your attitudes towards it. That's interesting. Yeah. I'll be curious to read those papers too. We've just got about 10 minutes left. I wonder if anyone else in the audience has questions. I'll just add some information about turning on the cameras, which I had put in the chat box. Yeah, I saw and, that. Sandy. Yeah. And our university has actually asked that we try and ask the students to do that, not force them, but at least ask them so that there is some kind of interaction. And as you can see, you see, I have a black box because my laptop died this weekend and I'm on, <laughs> uh, I'm on my desktop. Um, but it really, it, it really, we have found that it really does make a difference. You know, at first they might be a little tentative but then I also put in the chat box a little bit later that we also use polling during the Zoom session. And that has also helped with getting the students involved. You know, and especially if you put in like one fun question or trick question, you know, it, it might loosen up the students a little bit. And we have found that that has helped so much that the university is actually looking into buying like you know the real polling one you know not the free one that we use and hope that we don't go over the number of students so that's just a little aside nice. that's good from stuff. down here in philadelphia <laughs> <laughs> oh, i appreciate the feedback that's uh, uh that's yeah that's interesting i hadn't 
tried, I hadn't thought about using like, like a old fashioned or traditional icebreaker in, in a Zoom class to, mm -hmm. even, even if it doesn't get people to turn their mics on or their cameras on, just, yeah, it seems like a good way to potentially foster more engagement. That's a great idea. Right. Yeah, the first part of the, for the first part, for the first like six months of the pandemic, I hosted cat chat every morning for kids and their cats from 8 to 8.30 a.m. on weekdays. It's like a ton, a ton of cat chat. And now I feel like it really taught me how to, how to run a Zoom session is that you ask people to talk about a thing that they really care a lot about, which, you know, for kids under the age of eight and myself is cats. But, I, you know, imagining that as like a Zoom icebreaker that will get people to turn their cameras on, you know, what's the, you know. I, I've definitely like surreptitiously positioned my dog on my lap. If it, I think it's going to be like maybe a slightly more less engaged uh, class session. Um, mm -hmm. Like, oh, hey, there's my dog. She's popped her head up. Uh, like, it's a good of a, a bit of a good icebreaker. Yeah, the animal. Yeah, the, the animal and baby interruptions, I think, have been important to all of our mental health. Oh, yeah, all no, of yeah. this. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know if we have any other questions in the chat, but if people want to ask questions live, we're happy to um, have them. And I had a last question. Oh, let's see. Um, well, someone has a question, oh, Sean, um, I wonder if when we get on the other side of COVID and we're back face to face, if there will be requests that we combine Zoom without in-person sessions. That's an interesting concept. Um, I'm not sure how that would be, but Mason, can you help imagine? <laughs> yes, uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand completely. Um, with Sorry, I misspelled. That was a misspell I said with along with our Zoom. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> so like teaching a regular workshop, but also broadcasting it live on Zoom? Yeah. Yeah, I've done this before. I had, uh, there's a cl the class at LIU where I used to work with Kate, um, where it would be like students in the classroom, but then also a classroom in Israel. Oh. Um, on Zoom, yeah. It, it, it's definitely a thing I thought about, which I'm half expecting that that might mean it's me in the the classroom and no students uh, teaching to an empty classroom but 15 people on zoom um which i think there's still value that means 15 people got to see it that wouldn't have otherwise but that's gonna be a whole another learner curve like we're just getting used to um you know teaching to a bunch of black squares on our screen getting used to teaching in person to a bunch of empty chairs uh i, I it's certainly a thing i'm going to try i really am curious to try it out i have no idea <laughs> if it'll have legs or not, but I'm very curious to try it out. Yeah, I think at some schools they're required. And I have a friend who's teaching live in the classroom behind a, a wall and then also, um, you know, broadcasting live uh, elsewhere. So it's an interesting. With in-person students in the classroom and people from home. Yeah, so in-person behind a glass shield with a small microphone to project one's voice and then also simultaneously being recorded. So it's a funny ask, I think, of instructors everywhere. Um, I think for those kind of sessions, I would be much more hesitant to record those and put them up for posterity as opposed to, I will be offering this session from 12 to 1. Either come to this room or stay in your own room. Uh, I think I'd be a little more comfortable with that, at least in the trial run of, of that kind of instruction. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, which I think brings me to what may be the last question, but my own question is, um, how do you know it's working? I mean, um, beyond kind of the macro, sorry, the micro level of like, you know, a successful interaction with one student, I'm curious if you have, um, I don't know, any ways you assess all this kind of instruction at this time, or if it's any different than your usual, just to keep us on the COVID. It, I mean, it, 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 it's, I think one of the, the metrics of, of success, which again, it sort of ties back to a thing I, I mentioned, is any sort of repeat customers, right? There's no for, like formal assessment that, that involved, but like, you know, if I, you know, I have a student, uh, I think at four o'clock today, this will be the third time I've met with them um, over the past month and a half. Uh, so they're getting something out of it and they're continuing to come back. So that's wildly rewarding to me, right? I'm able to know that something is working right and that student comes back for help. Or whenever I do, not whenever, but almost every workshop that I run, there's one student at least that emails me afterwards to ask for a consult one-on-one -on -one, or even to ask questions over email. So it's, as an informal assessment, 
that seems to be something that seems to tell me some kind of story that there's some success and the fact that my consult numbers even this late in the semester are steadily if not increasing staying the same um is also indicative of some degree of if not success and engagement right so um again i don't think i have the bandwidth to, to do any sort of more formal assessment um, at the moment but you know we have the statistics we have them recorded so the data is there to look at at some point but um for just like immediate rewards like this is working someone wants my help uh i see value in that and i take that as, as rewarding and it's it's great totally and to me it's kind of a nice reminder that reference really is a relationship you know like you started off kind of saying because it's so different than let's say an interaction on chat where if a patient returned four times, I'd be like, oh, gee, did I not answer the question? Why are they returning? You know, because right. it's such a lot to hit a medium. Um, but yeah, so. And yeah, being able to same, see the same student three times over in the semester on a single project is also some narrative reward for me. Like I'm being able to track the story of this person's research and I can see how it's changing or improving or whatever and like that sort of narrative framework helps me uh, just get more satisfaction out of the, that kind of interaction. Definitely. Um, yeah, Emily, did you have any last thoughts or questions? No, it's been really interesting to think about the satellite library, especially in a time when we're all sort of satellite from and to each other. And I really appreciate you sharing your work with us today, Mason. Thank you. And thank you also to Elvis for pulling the uh, event together and doing the all of the infrastructuring work that we that we require. So I appreciate it. And thanks everyone for joining us today. I was a touch worried that because my paper about pre-COVID times, this wouldn't be entirely relevant, but since we're all satellite librarians now, that works. But great. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Bye. Have a great day. Bye again. See you soon.